Bonjour, Willkommen and Howdy. Welcome to today's programme. We're going to be having a look at this. This is the Panard AML 90. This was developed by the French Army in the late 50s and came into use in the beginning of the 1960s. This was really followed on from something called the Panard EBR. So that was an eight wheel drive vehicle with a larger uh, turret on it, but about the same size gun. And hopefully a picture of that will pop up on the screen here and show you what the precursor or the daddy was to this particular vehicle. That was quite a long vehicle. It had, as I said, eight wheels, had a driver at the front and a driver at the rear, simply because the turning circle was so big on it, they wanted to be able to get into trouble and out of trouble in the same speed. So it made a lot of sense to have a driver at the front and one at the rear. Now, Panel had been making armoured cars, well, since after the, well, in fact, one could argue uh, during the First World War, right through the second, and they came out the back end, and France was crippled by what happened to it by the German invasion. So this was one of the bright sparks that came out from the French armoured vehicle factories after the EBR was retired. So let's have a look at it. This is an all steel structured armoured car. We have the main body of it here and on the outside we have wings and what we describe as bins or storage areas around the outside. It gives it this quite large chunky look. It's mounting a turret on it. This turret turns 360 degrees and the gun elevates up to about uh, 20 degrees and goes down to about minus five. And on here we have a 90 millimeter. This is quite a low pressure gun because you will notice as earlier when you were walking towards it, it's actually not very big. And if you're going to fire a 90 millimeter round from this, the whole vehicle is going to rock quite a bit. So exactly what is the size of round that this vehicle uses? So as I said, it is a 90 millimeter gun. It's actually rifled and it fires one of these. You will notice this round isn't very long. That's because there's not a great deal of powder in the back here because this is a low pressure gun. Simply because if you had any more powder in there, the whole vehicle would become unstable whilst firing. Indeed, when these did fire even rounds at this size, then they did rock alarmingly. And that was why they were sometimes called noddies because they used to nod back and forth. So here's the round itself. Here's the casing and this is the projectile. You can see quite clearly that it's finned and at the front here we have a tungsten tip. So in total quite a small round in comparison certainly to the tanks, uh, the main battle tanks that this uh, little vehicle came up against. Okay so we're going to go around the vehicle now and look at the salient points of it. If you've never seen one of these before then I will explain them in layman's terms to exactly what we're looking at. So let's start at the front. On the front here we have something called a sand channel. So this is used to get the vehicle out of difficulty if it's on soft ground. So this is placed on the floor and the vehicle actually drives over this channel. There's two of them here. Over in the back we have the infrared lights. So these infrared lights plug into the front wings here and so the driver can uh, drive along with infrared goggles on and actually see where they're going in the dark. The headlamps are below and also you can see here a towing chain to get the vehicle out of trouble. These here are the Michelin tyres, so they are run flats. So inside of one of these, we have an inner tube, a solid one, that's got small holes within it that's filled with nitrogen. And if this tyre was punctured, then it would go down to a certain amount and then start running on that inner tube. The reason it was nitrogen in there, because it was an inert gas and it wouldn't necessarily catch light if this tyre was uh, heated up. We've got drum brakes on there, believe it or not. No power steering, it's all done manually, so it's quite an effort, especially when this is moving uh, slowly to, uh, to steer. We have on the side the always present jerry can, so designed by the Germans, copied by nearly all nations around the world, and here we have a French one on the side of this. We also have this, which looks rather like a fire extinguisher, but it's not. This is a decontaminator, so this was filled with a fluid, it was turned upside down, and you smash, well, the top of the canister, and it would eject the fluid, washing nuclear, biological, and chemical um, uh, particles off of the vehicle should they be contaminated. So you do see these on later French vehicles, especially ones that were serving in Germany. 
Moving further back, this here is the ejection port. So once the gun has been fired, you don't want lots of uh, old rounds inside of the turret. And so this would be opened and the empty brass casing would be thrown out. We have a spotlight on the top. This, you are right, is a helmet. And this was because inside of this vehicle, the, there were three people. There was a driver in the front, there was a gunner and a commander. Each of them would wear a plastic or fiber helmet. And once they popped their heads up at the top of uh, the turret there, you could place one of these tin uh, shells over the top of that plastic helmet to help, um, well, to be honest, wouldn't stop very much, but certainly stop bits of shrapnel uh, hitting you. We have two smoke dischargers, so these are going to shoot out smoke canisters to help mostly in uh, retreating or covering uh, your path. And then we just have the usual side bins in which materials are kept in here. We're going to go around the back now. So this is where all the fun happens. Inside of here is the petrol engine. So it's a four cylinder boxer engine. It's air cooled and if you looked at it, it looks very similar to what you would see in say a Porsche 911 from the early 60s. We'll try and open this up. You probably won't see much. These access ports are incredibly small. But inside of here, you can see the engine. Those people that are familiar with French military vehicles will note that the distributor over here, there we go, that distributor there is exactly the same as found on the Hotchkiss M201, but uh, the rest of uh, the engine is quite unique. The carburetor is a Zenith, and that's exactly the same as you would find on a 1962 Porsche 911. So it's quite a sports engine placed in quite a heavy body we'll say. Now this here, people are, have asked what exactly this is, and this is a compressor. So the idea is that when you are driving along and you suddenly hit uh, soft ground, you can let the pressure down in the tyres to give you extra grip, and then once you enter back onto the road, the problem is your tyres are now flat. So this compressor slides into a power takeoff here in the middle, under this cap, this attaches, your airline goes on here, and you use this to inflate your tyres. So that's quite a nifty idea by the French there. We've got our smoke dischargers, we've got our radio aerial, and we're coming round to uh, where we get into the vehicle. You did notice a door on the other side, that's more for emergencies. So this is where the driver or the commander and or the gunner would enter if they weren't using the turret hatches at the top. The door opens forward. The reason for this is if you're exiting the vehicle, you can actually use this as cover. So if you were being shot to the front. And here we have the fuel filler cap. Now an interesting thing about these vehicles is they don't have a fuel gauge. So you can imagine if you're driving along and the vehicle starts to stutter and you're thinking, my goodness, how much fuel did I put in? There's only one way of finding out how much fuel is inside the vehicle. You need one of these, so you do not want to lose it. This is described as the cruciform. And on the end is a hexagonal drive that fits into this fuel filler cap. The armored one is removed. Below is a brass inner. That again is unscrewed. Now, as you can imagine, if you're in a war zone, you're being shot at. I'm now outside the vehicle, which is dangerous enough, and I'm having to start mus <laughs> messing around with a very easily losable piece of equipment to see how much fuel I've got. Okay, so how do we see what's in the tank? Inside of here, I would describe it as Charlie Chaplin's walking cane. So this really is a piece of cane with markings on it showing the amount of fuel that's actually in the tank. You can see we're right down here and we're nearly out, so we do need to refuel the vehicle. So put that back in. You don't want to lose that. What I have found in the past with some of these vehicles that I've restored is the fact that cane gets dropped inside the fuel tank. And when you actually look inside there, you can see two or three of them. So uh, even though a very basic system for measuring the fuel uh, easily can uh, go wrong. So okay. Okay, we'll leave that afterwards. Moving forward, 
fire extinguisher, carbon dioxide, and a nice view of one of those tyres. Hi, so here we are, not much room at all. We have a driver in this position that's up the front. You may not get a very good sense of this on the camera, but to your side there, we can actually see where the commander goes. So that's his seat. And over here, higher, <laughs> over here, we have the loader. So again, very, very cramped. You've got to think there's three fully grown men in here and all their kit. So here at the driving position, we'll just go through some of the controls. This is the main electrical box. So this controls the lights and also this is your fuses. And if you have to jump start the vehicle, we have a socket here. So this is where all the electrics are for the entire panard. In front of you, you have the steering wheel. This has a quick release module. This can be undone and this entire steering wheel can be taken off and thrown out through the aperture. This is because if you were hit and the vehicle is alight, then you might want to exit it very quickly. And so your best bet is going that way. If the turret's in use and it's rotated, the turret has a basket and this actually blocks off the driver. So it was very important that he could be able to undo this and get out through here. We have basic dials. These are showing the charge rate, the revs, the speed. So these are all in kilometers an hour. I've managed to have this, uh, this panard up to 95 kilometers an hour. I think it would have gone to 100, but it's getting a little bit unstable at that speed because it's a quite a heavy piece of kit. Uh, it was a white knuckle ride to be honest at that speed. And we have here is the oil temperature. It's currently showing quite high because the electrical system isn't activated and that'll drop down. Over here, very simply, indicators left and right, the horn. This is for turning um, high and low beam on your lights. And these are the two, the little dashboard here is the most important out of the lot. To start this, we're going to go down here and look at the gear stick a second. The gear stick needs to be in neutral. If you look ahead, you will see only two pedals. One is the accelerator and one is the brake. That's because there is no clutch pedal. This is what you would describe as a pre-select gearbox. I'm using the word pre-select because you might recognize that. But in effect, what happens is you choose gear by pressing down on this knob on the top of the gear stick. It engages the clutches. You actually then choose the gear sliding in. You then rev the vehicle and then the gear is engaged. OK, so we're going to make sure that's neutral before we start. We're now going to turn on the electrics. So this is the battery. You probably heard a click there. That was the electrics. Uh, being, as I would describe, excited. We're now going to put on the electrical system. Okay, you can now see on the dash we've got a red oil light warning. This will go out once the engine starts. I'm double checking that uh, gear stick. And then we press the starter button. Now, for a more, most effective start, you really do want to pump the accelerator a few times. So we'll see if it, ha if it will uh, go on this. Yeah, okay, we're okay. So let's go to the back. Have a listen to that engine. Okay, you probably can't hear me very well because of the sound of the engine behind me, but what I'm going to do now, and it may not pick this up very well on this camera, is I'm actually going to rev it. I'm going to bring it up to about 4,000, 5,000 RPM, and we'll have a, have a listen to what a wonderful sounding engine this is. So it's an air cooled pan hard, 2.5 litre, flat 4. Let's rev it. across the back. 